You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello Book Talk Today family and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host and in today's podcast we are joined by Sam Gilbert. Sam is an affiliated researcher at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. He is also an expert in data-driven marketing, being part of the fintech startup bought by many as the chief marketing officer. And today we'll be discussing his most recent book, Good Data, An Optimist Guide to Our Digital Future. Sam and I had a great conversation around what makes good data, the relationship between data and our privacy, and the future of our data. We touched upon some important points given the last two years. I think everyone has been a lot more conscious about their data, how it is being used by companies, and also companies have been making efforts to make sure that they are keeping their customers' data. And it's very interesting. We talked about Cambridge Analytica. We talked about what the future of data might be if we are to move to the metaverse in Zuckerberg's dream. So yeah, we touched upon so many points in the podcast and I look forward to sharing with you. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast. Every week we release a podcast with an author to discuss their book as well as the ideas and principles inside of it. We have some great guests lined up in 2022 and we've had some great podcasts already this year. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to our podcast, whether you're listening to this on YouTube, Spotify or Apple. If you are listening to this on Spotify and Apple, please do head over to our YouTube channel at Book Talk Today. That is the best way that you can support the channel in a free way. Just head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe there. Without further ado, here is the podcast with Sam. Enjoy. Sam, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me on. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. And this idea of how we use our data and how data rules our lives is an interesting one. It's a, been a topic of interest for me personally for the last, I want to say probably four or five years, ever since I've started to post more online and questions about who owns my data, who owns the things that I put out on the internet. It's a question I think a lot of people are, are asking themselves in this day and age. So uh, your book was an interesting one and, and I'm really looking forward to talk about some of the ideas and principles inside of it. Uh, but before we do that, um, in the book, you mentioned that you know you transitioned from working full time and went back to study uh, politics. And as a student of politics myself, that was my uh, bachelor's degree. I just wanna get some insight into why you decided to go back to school um, at that later point in your life and just talk about your journey to doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And what a nice thing to be able to talk to another politics student and enthusiast. Yeah. So I think, I mean, it, it probably came from the fact that I had been working at Bought by Many, which is a fintech business that I co-founded back in 2012 and for about six years. And I think that was about twice as long as I had had any other job in my whole career. And I started to think about what was going to come next for me. And I couldn't really figure out what that was. And then I went away on holiday to um, a, a wonderful Greek island called Patmos. And part of my uh, task for that holiday was to try and give myself some ideas about where my career ought to go. And I was really getting nowhere at all. But I found myself listening um, almost compulsively to this podcast called Talking Politics. I, I don't know if you know it. It's um, yeah. actually done by the, the politics faculty at Cambridge, so hosted by David Runciman and often features Helen Thompson. And I just basically listened to the entire back catalogue of talking politics during that trip and at some point it just kind of fell into place uh, and I was like oh yeah that's that's the thing that I'm really interested in right now it's, it's politics I need to know more about this and so that was how I got this uh, kind of somewhat crazy seeming idea of leaving a very successful startup to go back to university. How was that experience and that transition from the working world into studying politics? Because I'm very aware of studying sort of the ins and outs of political theory and understanding 
uh, sort of if you go back to understanding in the book you talk about like John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham and all these types of uh, figureheads for liberal politics and so how was that transition and did you have any experience with it in the past and just how was how was that transition? Yeah it was it was quite strange it was quite abrupt and it was quite difficult and in, in a lot of ways so I think when you work in the commercial sector you do read a lot of things and you do absorb a lot of information but generally most of the time you do that at quite a superficial level so really you're looking for the tldr bullet points for any bit of text um, or you're looking for the really simple executive summary that somebody's going to give you at the start of the really simple powerpoint presentation they have prepared for you and obviously doing academic research and academic study is almost the polar opposite of that so it's, it's really important that you pay very close attention to what the text is saying and work really hard to make sure you've just understood the argument that the author is making so if i found that like very demanding after such a long gap i think it was you know like almost two decades since i had been a student previously so it took a lot of getting used to and I think similarly, the lifestyle and the daily routine of studying is so different from working in an organization. So the fact that the majority of the day is spent in the library or in your room reading stuff, if you're used to and enjoy talking to other people and working as a team, that, that can be really hard. And that was, that was one of the biggest challenges for me really was um, being solo again. How did that change your perception to the work that you did previously? And how did it change your mindset towards the things that you were doing? Yeah, yeah I mean, great, great question. So I think I, I learned quite a lot of about myself in terms of the things that I get energy and motivation from. And so one massive learning for me was that it's just really important that I get to work with people. And although I probably think of myself as an introvert, I still really need some some human contact and I love being part of teams that are trying to do something together um, and then I think I probably also um, like I, I did learn quite a lot about the value of I suppose properly engaging with arguments and, and re like really trying to think in a rigorous way rather than just accepting the sort of neatly packaged sound bites that you get in a business environment or that you might hear on the news about political decision making or whatever. So those are probably the two key things. Yeah, it's that polarizing aspect that you don't get when you study politics. Because I remember when I studied it, it was very much, okay, try and understand both sides of the argument and you try to come up with a hypothesis that you might create yourself and say to yourself, okay, what are the good parts of this argument and what are the bad parts of this argument? And you do the same with the other side. And I feel like it gives you a good opportunity to have a look at both sides of an argument and don't seem so polarized and, and fit yourself into one camp or another. I think that's absolutely right. In fact, I was talking to somebody by coincidence the other day about the Talking Politics podcast and about David Ransom in particular. So for people who don't know, he's a professor of politics at Cambridge and he's done this series recently called History of Ideas where he looks at historical figures who have been important for the development of political thought and really goes into a lot of detail about the ideas that they present and my friend who I was talking to about this said that the thing she really values about this is how respectful he is towards the ideas so it becomes less about what his gut reaction to Hannah Arendt or Mary Wollstonecraft or John Stuart Mill or whoever it may be is and much more about trying to fairly and accurately reflect the argument they were making in the historical context they were making it and I think that's such a valuable thing to do and exactly as you say these times that can feel very polarized yeah, and you understand the context. What you said there is really important because I think a lot of people now are looking back at what people said or people's thoughts. Like a recently I had someone on the podcast and we we're talking about Immanuel Kant and his individual viewpoint about, you know, moral philosophy or whatever his specific way of, of, of seeing the world was. But then his thought was a snapshot in time, in the time in which he lived. So you can't exactly take his viewpoint out of context from the situation past and put it in today's world 
which I think is very interesting when it comes to politics, because you understand how politics, economics, sociology, philosophy, and history are all sort of intertwined uh, in one another. Yeah, this is this is so right. And I actually watched that episode and it really made me smile, that reference to Immanuel Kant, partly because I'm a like quite a fan of this a sort of political theory called realism, which is uh, it's kind of connected to this same tradition that's very strong in the Cambridge politics department of trying to read authors in the historical context. There's this very well-known realist philosopher called Bernard Williams, who is a big advocate of making sure you understand the context for, uh, for, for thought and for books. And he has this phrase, which I really like, which is, um, you know, people sometimes try to be Immanuel Kant at the court of King Arthur. So what he means by that is people think they can apply Kantian principles of enlightenment and rationality in a context where obviously the court of King Arthur, it was probably quite a violent and brutal place. And of course, it's absurd that you would try to do that. But instinctively, we try to do that all the time. You know, we read Machiavelli and say, well, what can Machiavelli tell us about the office politics in a 21st century corporation? And of course, that's, that, that's yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say it's completely ridiculous, but there's going to be limits to how meaningful such insights are going to be. I think that was a potentially a flaw that I saw in, in when I studied politics as well, is the, the understanding that everyone tries to attribute too much meaning to things that are happening right now and trying to attribute a political philosophy or an idea to it. And you just don't know at, at times, you know, you're living in this fog of attaching an idea or an ideology to what's happening contemporarily in politics. And I don't think sometimes the synergy is there. Sometimes things just happen randomly and you can't attribute an idea to it per se. Yeah, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. It seems to be a, a sort of human instinct to try and make sense out of stuff. So we kind of cast about for models and frameworks and thinkers who can help us with that task. But exactly as you say, sometimes it's just, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's chaotic and you can't really structure it to make sense of it in that way. So how was the transition then from, from researching that in studying politics to writing this book on data and how we should see data on our world and your case studies into companies like Google and Facebook? Facebook was a prominent example and case study within the book. So how was that transition and how did your study and research sort of influence the book that you've written? Yes, yes. So I, as part of the master's program in Cambridge, I wrote a thesis which was really about Facebook and Facebook's power and how we ought to think about that from the perspective of political theory. So the thesis was called um, rather grandiosely towards a theory of digital legitimacy. And wow. so, so that's, um, and, and like I guess the thinking I did for that kind of became probably maybe like maybe chapter one, but then mostly chapters sort of six, seven, eight of uh, my book, Good Data. Um, so just kind of by a strange coincidence when I was still physically living in Cambridge I went to a, a, a garden party and got talking to somebody at a garden party who very politely asked me about the research I was doing on Facebook and so I was explaining this to him and he said do you know I feel like that would make such a good book for a general audience why don't I introduce you to my to my literary agent and you can have a chat about that so, so that, that was the that was how I ended up turning this quite um, sort of academic piece of writing into a book for a general readership. And I suppose one of the things that I've found fascinating to learn about through this journey has been how nonfiction books get written. And so Jonathan, who's my um, agent, helped me develop my thinking into something that was going to say something a bit broader and something that people who are readers of smart thinking books and who've got a general interest in questions of data or technology and how those affect politics would find interesting as opposed to what I had as the product of my academic studies which was something that's interesting to political theory academics maybe. Um, so one of the things that we worked out would be a good thing to bring to the book Good Data was some of the experience I'd had in the previous parts of my career. So working in the, the data company Experian, for example, and then 
um, co-founding and growing a technology business brought by many. And so the book sort of became a mixture of academic type argument, but also with real life experience. So in some respects, it's, it's a memoir as well as a book that tries to make a, an argument. And I mean, to come back to your question, I really enjoyed the process of writing it. And actually after spending a year having to concentrate really hard and choose my words about everything really, really carefully, it was very liberating just to be able to write in a slightly less academic, more accessible, um, conversational style. Mm. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a really enjoyable process to do the writing. I think a lot of authors as well over the past two years have been their work. We've had a lot of authors on the podcast that have either written their first book uh, in the past sort of two years and have written it under COVID and have published it under COVID as well. And they've talked about how the writing experience has been in, in that environment, both from the aspect of their personal living conditions, but also, you know, the general atmosphere out in the public and how the writing has, or the research topics have been shaped by the outside environment. How much did that influence your writing? Because so much of the book is about data and social media companies and news and how all of that sort of work together to dictate, you know, privacy and and all these major topics in such a period mm. of time where all of us have been asking these questions so how did that influence your your writing then uh, with with that atmosphere yeah well I, I guess there were so many different strands to it so i mean the, the first thing like i'm very sympathetic to people who ended up having to do the writing of their books during the periods of lockdown because i it was hugely valuable for me to because i was writing well, I, I did most of the writing in the six to nine months before corona really hit and, and lockdowns came in so and I, I so valued being able to go to cafes and libraries and like regularly change the environment that i was working in so yeah. that, that, that that was one sort of aspect to it but i guess also i feel in relation to the themes of the book public perceptions changed a bit on some of the questions that I discuss as a result of the pandemic. So I think if we think back to the, the period of the first lockdown, that really sort of terrifying beginning to this pandemic period that we've all been living through, data really came to the fore in terms of public discussion. So all over social media, all over the news, every single day we were seeing charts of cases and deaths and people became familiar with these quite strange and abstract concepts like the r number so i think everybody's data literacy got a sudden sort of crash course and, and increased in a very dramatic way and i think probably also the climate around privacy shifted a little bit so there was again this is going back to the period of the first lockdown in the UK there was quite a lot of interesting discussion around things like contact tracing apps and of course Google and Apple made this decision that because they were trying to be respectful of individuals privacy they essentially prevented governments from being able to build contract tracing apps that had centralized data sets in the middle of them and of course what that led to was contact tracing apps in the West being much less effective than contact tracing apps in South Korea, for example, or in Singapore, where the government uh, was prepared to be a bit more centralizing and where public opinion wasn't so uneasy with the idea that this type of sensitive health data would be collected. So I just thought that was fascinating the way all of a sudden this conversation about data and privacy and the trade-offs in terms of public goods versus individual privacy, they all of a sudden became much more real because of what was going on in the pandemic. And yeah, and I, and I suppose the final thing is I just, um, I just about had time to work into the book, some, uh, some pandemic content, which I'm quite kind of grateful about because Otherwise, I feel like the book would have dated really fast. And that would have been super annoying. Yeah, yeah. 
I think the interesting thing in the in the book you talked about in reference to the, the the first point you made was about this one of data openness about this thing that people fall into two camps you either get the for the, the people who say you know I don't want anything to be shared they don't go on any social media websites they are very careful about going into private mode anytime they use a browser they're very very careful about how they use their data which websites they sign up to and these types of things and then you have the people who are just like I don't care I don't do anything malicious or bad they can take whatever they want it doesn't particularly matter but I think in the book you you made an interesting case for data openness in respect to health data because when someone uses a certain application or Google, or whatever, and they, they're asking certain questions, the more content is made on it and the more information is spread on the subject, which increases the awareness around it, which I think is a, an interesting aspect to your use of data that I don't think enough, enough people talk about. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. And I mean, you, you touched on something really crucial there, which is this sort of, again, it's a form of polarization that I think exists around these issues. So as you say, people who are very, very um, keen on privacy and then people who are kind of largely disengaged from what happens to data and how data does just sort of pour out of us as we live our lives online and also in environments that have got physical devices that are connected to the internet. And I guess one of the arguments that I wanted to make in the book is that there's just trade-offs involved in uh, data and privacy and probably the best outcome for us collectively as a, society, is, as a society is if we can find some sort of sensible balance. So of course we don't want a situation where everybody's sensitive health data and everybody's financial records are just openly available on the blockchain or whatever for anybody to go and inspect. But also it would be a real shame if we went more towards treating all of the data that we generate as being private property. And one example that I talk about in the book that I'd be really sad if this couldn't happen anymore is Google search data. So um, one of the really powerful things that can happen if people are comfortable with their anonymized Google searches being aggregated and made available to researchers and to companies is that um, we, we can find interesting and creative responses to some of the challenges we're facing. So one of the things I talk about in the book is some work mm. done by a guy called Bill Lampos at University College London. So he and his team built a predictive model for new COVID cases using anonymized internet search data. And that model uh, successfully predicts cases 17 days in advance of the conventional epidemiological methods. And I suppose it's hypothetically possible that somebody's privacy might end up getting compromised from that data being available. But we have to weigh against that, the enormous benefit that we can get collectively by allowing people like Bill to analyze the data and make public health recommendations based on it. But the specificity of doing a Google search isn't necessarily displaying your current health data. It's just saying, for instance, like, why am I feeling this way? How can I, you know, like most people do when they have an issue, you know, they're like, I have a beating, you know, pulse in, in my chest. What does this mean? Kind of thing. So I don't necessarily think it's, that's a bad thing from a privacy point of view, because someone's actually inputting a question into a search engine. Yeah, well, I think some people probably misunderstand what's going on with that, that particular type of data. And they imagine that the, well, Google is compiling a record of your complete search history and the researchers are able to then go and look specifically at what Owen was Googling when he was worried about the headache that he got, like, is it, was it, is it COVID or is it a hangover or whatever? Um, but of course that isn't, that, that isn't really what's going on. It's that that data, search data is useful in aggregate. So it's useful when um, thousands or millions of people's data is put together. And when you're doing analysis of this data, that's what you care about. Like you just no, nobody is really interested or needs to um, understand what any individual did. They just need to know like what did the hive mind 
what was what, think about this topic or what symptom were they googling on this particular day so you know i hope if people read the book who are maybe a little bit more concerned about how data is used um, in, in the context of health i hope that i do a good job of explaining why the privacy risks of that type of thing are, are not really that significant and the benefits to society and to the public are really substantial i think it's detaching this idea from data of social media companies to the the plethora of the way that data is used by many many different companies because i think the media does a terrible job in saying the only way that, that your data is used is by these evil social media companies who are using it to do targeted ads so anytime you you know have a look at a dog collar you get a dog collar ad and the next you know whatever it is you know website that you go to but i think in the book and generally if you think about it a bit more when it comes to data there's so many different ways that your data is captured and I think getting out of this, this weird, I don't know, prison that we see ourselves in of seeing that data is just from these social media companies can be, I think, detrimental to our perception. Yeah, I mean, although, like I have to say, I am also a fan of targeted ads somewhat controversially. So I, I actually think targeted ads are a net benefit to society. Um, Utilitarian. On the, yeah, on yeah, the yeah. Ads. You could you could do the utilitarian calculus on yeah. it. So, I mean, again, similar reasons to what we already touched on in relation to Google data is that when advertisers are using Facebook, for example, to run advertising campaigns, they're not they, they don't get to see somebody's individual Facebook likes or their browsing history or anything like that. They just get to say to Facebook, I'd like to show my dog collar ads to people who have dogs, please. And the Facebook algorithms take care of matching the advertiser's target segment to the news feeds of people who are on Facebook. So I think it's, it probably works in a less personalized way than people think. And I think from, from my perspective, there's a few benefits to it. So one is, um, we just like for better or worse, we live in a world where we get free internet services, we get free Google search, free email, free Instagram, free Twitter, free TikTok, whatever, because of advertising. So advertising is the thing that funds it and means we don't have to pay a subscription like we do for Netflix. So if if we accept that we're going to have ads, then we have a choice between having ads that are targeted and which may you know like I, I don't think they do this all the time but let's let's say six or seven times out of ten the ads that you see on social media are probably something that you might be interested in if they were untargeted what we would see all the time would be lowest common denominator ads so we would see ads for gambling websites we would see ads for hookup apps we would see ads at the moment probably for cryptocurrencies as those seem to be kind of all over the place in, in traditional media. So, so we actually get some sort of benefit as individuals, I think, from ads being targeted to us. And then the other thing that I think is really important and often goes missing from the discussion about targeted advertising is that for smaller businesses and for startups, it is massively valuable to be able to target your prospective customers. And if there were no targeted ads, people who were starting small businesses but just find it like almost impossible to reach customers because when as i know from starting a company when you're just at the beginning you can't afford to buy tv advertising you can't afford to buy press advertising you can't afford to send a direct mail campaign to lots of people you need ways of marketing your product that are really cheap and where you can learn by spending 20 pounds or 50 pounds or 100 pounds a day rather than having to spend literally millions on these above the line campaigns so if we didn't have um, tools like facebook ads and google ads it would be massively to the advantage of companies that are already rich and well known and successful and have great brands and have massive marketing budgets and it would be massively to the disadvantage of innovative new businesses that want to do things like sell dog collars or, or, or pick any other um, uh, product that, yeah. that you might want to sell online.
like I, I love going through my Instagram and I see all these sort of Kickstarter campaigns for like technology devices, like the, the mouse case thing. I don't know people like drop the things from the helicopters and stuff. I got that from Instagram. <laughs> There's some shoes that I saw on Instagram that I got. So I personally like it because I see all these products that I wouldn't otherwise have seen, you know, before, like uh, Peak Design was another one. You know, I saw through a Kickstarter campaign, these types of things. Um, but from your book as well, it seems like those targeted ads are actually more effective than if you were to go do, let's say, a billboard or you're going to do a major TV spot. Because it seems like you get more for your money because you're targeting your certain demographic that you need to target. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. And that matters particularly for businesses that are smaller or an earlier stage. So I, I think it's. Well, again, this is stuff learned from building a startup. You get to a point with a, a successful business where there's no alternative but to try and build brand awareness. And doing that, there's no alternative to traditional channels like TV or billboards or, or, or tube ads if you're in London or whatever. But yeah, but I mean, before that point, and this is true for the vast majority of businesses, it's just so much more efficient to try and speak directly to the niche audience that best fits the products that you've got. And that's, that's the thing that targeted advertising enables you to do. Did you ever feel somewhat questioned the ethics of targeted advertising when you did it at all, when you had the startup or would your focus purely on growing your user base and that was your sole concern or was there a part of your mind thinking you know what is the engine that runs this and and what are the potential ethics behind it yeah i mean so it, it's really hard to say because obviously with things like the cambridge analytica scandal and with a lot of the public discussion of these issues that has happened subsequently it has been impossible to think about and talk about targeted advertising without considering the ethical dimension to it. And obviously there are all these really problematic uses of the technology and political campaigning. So I you know, personally, based on what I've read and what I understand about the techniques, I don't think Facebook ads played a particularly significant role in Donald Trump getting elected, but they absolutely have played a significant role in the growth of support for the alternative for Deutschland, which is the ultra-right party in Germany. And there are, there are kind of many other sort of problematic cases that expose some of the downsides of allowing technology that's been developed for selling dog collars or shoes or insurance um, as a means of getting support for political parties and political causes. But anyway, so this, 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 this is all stuff that seems a lot clearer in retrospect than it did at the time. I think the stuff that was probably um, on my mind at the time was, and, and the, you know, this probably goes back to the period when I was mostly working with this would be like 2009 through to 2016. Um, I think sometimes the, um, the kind of the, the marketing industry in the old days was like, like probably said some, or probably described customer segments in ways that were like, like wouldn't be acceptable nowadays. So, you know, I used to work at a data company called Experian and it has this segmentation system called Mosaic. And so some of the old labels that Mosaic applied to particular demographics probably now would seem a bit um, politically incorrect. And I can remember like thinking at the time, I'm not, I'm not totally sure I'm on board with having a customer segment. I mean, I can't remember the specific example now, but there was one that mentioned the fact that this, this segment were people who lived in council houses and it was, it, it didn't feel quite right to me to sort of stereotype people based on whether they lived in council houses or not. And mm. um, so, so those, those things definitely occurred to me. And then I think also one of the things you, you learn even in the old days before the issues were so prominent, um, you, you learn very quickly if you cross the line with targeting. So if you inadvertently or deliberately use data in a way that is disrespectful or too 
invasive or in poor taste, then people really let you know that you've you've made a mistake. So you know, I probably I think I write a bit in the book about when we started Bought by Many, we had a a, a, a product for a travel insurance product for people who had diabetes. So I, I spent some time using Facebook ads to target people with diabetes. And there were definitely things I, I got wrong about that where I just wasn't sufficiently attuned to mm. w- what it's like to have diabetes. And I do think it's it's incumbent upon people, practitioners of targeted marketing, to be sensitive to those issues and to think about the ethical implications of what they're doing for sure. How do you see the transition from one of the conversations that's come up since uh, COVID-19 and in the last couple of months, it seems like everyone's talking about Web 3.0 and cryptocurrencies and how that can change the relationship to data with decentralized decentralized ledger systems and no one really is in control of it per se. Um, But there's obviously questions about that, about, you know, for instance, if it goes down, who, how do you recover it? Where does it go? These types of questions. So how do you see the new uh, Web 3.0 changing our relationship to data? Do you see it changing at all? Or do you see a new sort of plethora of other concerns coming to the fore? Yeah, it's such a, such a great and interesting question. So I think probably the first thing to say is that it's not, none of this is settled yet. There's a, a very sort of passionate community of people who are very strong advocates for web3 and and in fact that whole brand exists to convey the idea that we're on the cusp of the internet working in this whole exciting new way and i I suppose like some of my thoughts on it are that i i am not sure that decentralization and disintermediation are good things in and of themselves Mm. and when you read about the some of the historical origins of bitcoin and blockchain and other web3 technologies it becomes clear that they're quite tightly entwined with the libertarian right and with some quite some thinkers who have some quite extreme Mm. perspectives on how society ought to be organized and what the role of the government is and once you've made that connection you start to notice that people like Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey are regularly quoting uh, these quite extreme thinkers like Murray Rothbard and referring to the government as being an illegitimate monopoly and like all these other kind of quite mm-hmm. quite wacky, or in my opinion, they're, they're, they're quite they're yeah. problematic ideas. So, you know, and that's so that's the reason why people who are really into blockchain and web three think decentralization is important. It's basically because they think centralized authorities are inherently bad and they inherently compromise the freedom of the individual. I suppose I having studied this for the last few years, take the view that actually there's a lot of value in having trusted central authorities. But what's important is that those trusted central authorities are democratically accountable and that we have they have the right incentives to behave in a way that is in the public interest and they're transparent with that as well yeah transparency exactly such an important thing and i think also a lot of web3 people will say well blockchain gives you the ultimate transparency but i'd much rather have um central authorities that are forced to be transparent rather than the transparency having to come at the cost of there not being anybody you can hold accountable when something goes wrong so i mean and i think a lot of people who speculated a bit in cryptocurrencies are finding this at the moment that you accidentally yeah. send currency to the wrong address and it, it, it's gone like it's yeah. not coming back there's <laughs> nobody you can appeal to there's nobody to resolve your complaints yeah. you're you're screwed yeah you can't go to your bank and be like i have sent that to the wrong person please can you help me yeah and they go oh god another person who's done that really obvious but easy thing to do yeah fair enough we'll get the money back yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's or they happening. have built-in mechanisms they have built-in mechanisms to stop people doing that i think yes, an interesting precisely. i think an interesting thing that you mentioned there on the aspect of authoritarian um the the authorities that you have as an intermediary for the things that you want to do so i've been thinking a lot recently about this whole party scandal with the tory party and the report by susan gray that came out and the 
uh, this is not an affiliation to one party or another, but from a leadership perspective, the complete and utter disregard for someone's actions, you know, if, if you know what I mean, there's no accountability to that. But as a citizen, what would you rather have? Would you have someone that you can say to yourself, oh, you did this and you're accountable to your actions as a leader, or you have this decentralized platform where you actually don't know who's running it or, or who is in charge of it. There's no one person you can point your finger to. And if something goes wrong, then who do you point the finger at? And there's also this aspect of like literacy, because how many people are literate in blockchain technology or cryptography or the actual underlying systems behind how it works from a peer to peer transaction to the actual platforms that you can use to do this type of stuff to the mining to the energy resource it seems like to me there's a massive barrier between it being decentralized and a select number of people who just own the infrastructure and the knowledge surrounding it yeah exactly and in, in some respects it comes back to some of these libertarian ideas about how society ought to be organized because i think a lot of the people who promote these ideas are highly technically literate so they're software developers and as far as they're concerned if you're not capable of reading the code in a smart contract on the blockchain then you're inferior in some way mm. and so I, I guess they would just say well let the buyer beware caveat or you know you needed to read that code and the fact that your money has now been stolen or you've sent it to the wrong place that's just that's on you and you're technological incompetence and of course i kind of you know, i'm i mean partly because i'm you know i can do a bit of html but that's about the extent of my coding knowledge <laughs> so that's not really going to work for me personally yeah um, but then one of the things that sort of comes back in is well if if you if, if we accept that most people are not going to be able to do due diligence on blockchain based smart contracts themselves then we're going to need some sort of service that they can use to validate those contracts before they uh, agree to them and so all of a sudden we're back to a situation where we need a trusted centralized third party to be able to fulfill some important functions make the ecosystem work and it's a little bit similar with things like the uh, open sea the nft marketplace or some of the cryptocurrency exchanges like coinbase and, and binance i mean these are it, they're centralized authorities. I mean, they're, they're not set up as, uh, you know, this um, blockchain people will talk about distributed autonomous organizations, which is where the accountability really is diffused. All of these platforms are not set up like that. And if they were, they wouldn't be as popular because people would have nobody to fix their problems when things go wrong. And then, I mean, to come back to that point about leadership, yeah, I mean, I, I'm absolutely on board with the benefits of the sorts of democratic systems that we've evolved over the last several hundred years where it's clear that if we elect political representatives they're accountable to us as citizens in some way and if we don't like what they do we get to kick them out and exactly as you say if um, power is sort of diffused into a network that just becomes impossible that becomes impossible and it becomes an, an issue of, like we said, the literacy behind it, because uh, in the book as well, you talked talked about this idea of, you know, what will the future look like when, you know, jobs potentially might be replaced by um, machines and artificial intelligence. I know you dedicated a bit of the book to that. And what happens when there's that gap in financial and, and technological literacy that comes from that that increase and i think that is a, a a big talking point i think a lot of conversation around technology is going to move away from ai changing our lives into this idea of okay how will ai actually change our relationship with one another from a ideological from a political point of view and and how we actually see each other ethically yeah i mean and i, I suppose i have a, a fairly uncontroversial views on this and that i think AI, machine learning, these kind of emerging technologies that are potentially very powerful, they need to be applied in a way that is in service of humanity. In, and, and I mean that just in quite, a, quite an old fashioned way. So they have the potential to create more economic inequality. They have the potential to reinforce 
forms of bias and discrimination that we're all already all too familiar with based on our knowledge of the current world and our knowledge of history. And it, yeah, it, it just it, it just seems to me really important that, that we focus on using these technologies in a way that's um, going to be the most socially beneficial and that might conflict a little bit with what other people would like to do which is have a sort of climate where innovation can happen permissionlessly and people can become fabulously wealthy and mm. successful without necessarily having much social that's a wider social responsibility attached to that and i think it'd be a shame if we end up in that world i think a conversation that i've heard happening from especially tech leaders is this idea that there could be automation for let's say a certain type of job and then they can those individuals can go from manual labor to then focus on creativity and, and art and these types of things which then can transform the way in which our world works but these mundane jobs can be automated which i think is an interesting proposition but i don't know whether it's very utopian i haven't quite <laughs> come to that conclusion yet yeah and it's so interesting isn't it because it actually is very similar to stuff that john maynard keynes was writing about in the 1930s I and mean, he imagined by this point i think that we would be on average working 15 hours a week and we'd be able to spend the remaining time pursuing whatever gave us meaning and purpose and whatever we were passionate about. And of course that hasn't really, despite the fact that technology has advanced a lot since the 1930s, that hasn't really happened. So there's, I think there's maybe one problem with that vision there, um, which is it just doesn't seem to correspond to what's happened in history. And then I think there's another problem with it, which is that I, I kind of think that work matters quite a lot to people, even um, work that technology leaders might think is manual or repetitive it's a source of pride for people it's, it's something that creates identity for particular areas of the country um, as we were talking about earlier it's something that also creates social contacts um, so I think I'm, I'm, I don't think we should be ready to dispense with the idea of work as a you know, a, a useful and fulfilling activity for, for people to do just yet. Yeah, I know. Over the weekend, m my brother and I were doing some home renovations and we're not very DIY literate, but we uh, were creating a loft boards and we we're putting up loft boards on our loft. It was very sort of simple DIY type of stuff, and but we haven't really done it. And he's a he's an accountant, so he's very financial literate and I'm a software developer. So our roles are very sort of technical when it comes to that aspect. And we both thoroughly enjoyed it. And I thought to myself, you know, preparation for this conversation, I thought to myself, you know, all these tech leaders are looking to sort of get rid of these mundane jobs for you spending our time and attention on these types of things. But there's a great source of enjoyment that comes from something that is that quite manual and mundane because you don't have to think about it too much. It's very much nail, screw in <laughs> with your with your drill and you're, and you're done. Yeah, t totally. Like I, I'm similarly um, not all that competent at DIY but I mean it is a very particular type of satisfaction I mean even something like putting together flat pack furniture and like starting off with the chaos of all of the the the, the I'm going to reveal my ignorance of these things now <laughs> the, the screws and all the other bits um, you, you just you, I mean you, you notice yourself becoming more adept at putting together the furniture as the task progresses and that, that itself is a source of satisfaction and then the physicality of the object um, is also just satisfying in some way that i don't think it's going to go away just because yeah. we can hypothetically go and hang out in the metaverse and play really immersive games i think people are still going to want stuff that involves using their hands and being physically engaged with the actual real world yeah no definitely like I, I went to my cousin's house a couple of weeks ago and they had the new oculus the thing you know we were, i was playing star wars and i was throwing lightsabers and stuff and i thought so this is quite fun until you realize that it's not real and you have to stop yourself to remember that it's not real because i'm not a jedi warrior and i'm, I'm not throwing lightsabers at random stormtroopers <laughs> i'm just in my, my cousin's living room just <laughs> just sort of just I don't know, looking lo probably like an idiot doing it. But yeah, it's interesting about where it might go and, and, and the future for it. I think it's interesting with Facebook changing their name to Meta. It's definitely a stamping point to where they want to go in the future. 
Yes, yeah, exactly. And, and that, that in itself is super interesting because I think on the one hand, it's clear that Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook's leadership has been very into virtual reality for a long time. I think 2014 they acquired Oculus and they've never made any money really from from virtual reality up until this point. So it's, it's definitely a big bet. But, and then also there's alternative explanations which relate to all of the bad press and all of the reputational damage that has accrued to the Facebook app in recent years. So, I mean, that's got to be a part of the story when it comes to the rebranding. So, so like super interesting times. I mean, I, I find the metaverse, um, well, I, I suppose, like, because I, I'm not really into gaming, mm. it's a difficult thing for me to imagine myself personally spending yeah. all that much time but I was trying to remember that of course lots of people do get a lot of enjoyment out of gaming like I think more than a billion people in the world play MMOs regularly so there must be something to um, just making the experience of gaming better and I wonder if there's also something to the reality of life in conditions of pandemic so you know, obviously we'd all like to put COVID behind us. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't. It seems quite likely there's going to be other zoonotic respiratory viruses that we have to contend with in the future. So I mm-hmm. suspect that probably homeworking and socialising remotely with friends and family is, is here to stay. And if the metaverse can be a place where we get a better experience of doing that than being on a Zoom call or chatting through slack or microsoft teams or whatever it might be then that you know like i I definitely uh, think that would be a good thing for us all definitely i think that's a very positive way to see it sam and i think it's a (laughs) nice positive positive note to finish the conversation on uh thank you so much for coming on the podcast to discuss uh your book good data and optimist guide to our digital future put the book right here um where's the best place for individuals to find you whether it be on on social media or, or website Sure. So my website is gooddataguide.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Sam Gilb. Perfect. I'll put the links to both of those in the description below um, so people can check you out. Fantastic. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so much for coming on, Sam. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Hopefully you took away some interesting points to think about regarding your data and about how companies use your data as well. Perhaps even you thought about where you sit in that spectrum of your data. Perhaps you sit in someone who doesn't particularly care how people use your data, or you might be someone who is very cautious about how companies use your data. Either way, hopefully you took some interesting thinking points that you can go and research further from this podcast. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast. Every week we release a podcast with an author to discuss their ideas and principles inside of their book. As I said at the beginning of this podcast, the easiest way to do that is to head over to our YouTube channel at Book Talk Today and subscribe there. Thank you again for listening to this podcast and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.